Hello and welcome. My name is Jade Powers, Assistant Curator at Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art and the curator of Deani Whitehawk Speaking to Relatives. Thank you for joining us virtually for a conversation with Deani Whitehawk and Carmen Irmo. Carmen Irmo is the Associate Curator at the Brooklyn Museum's Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. There she curated Roots of the Dinner Party, History in the Making and from 2017, form part of the Nobody Promise You Tomorrow, Art 50 Years After Stonewall Curatorial Collective in 2019, and co-curated Half the Picture, a feminist look at the collection in 2018, among other exhibitions. Carmen received her BA in Art History and English from the University of Richmond and her MA in Art History from Hunter College, and she lives in Jersey City. Diani Whitehawk is a visual artist and independent curator based in Minnesota. Whitehawk earned her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and BFA from the Institute of American Indian Art in Santa Fe, New Mexico. She has received numerous awards, including the, two, the 2020 Carolyn Glosko Bailey Foundation Minnesota Art Prize, the 2019 United States Artist Fellowship in Visual Arts, and the 2019 Idle Joy Fellowship for Contemporary Art. Kemp Museum would like to thank Jack and Karen Holland for their support of the Visiting Artists Program. Their generosity makes it possible for Kemper Museum to continue to have thoughtful and engaging programs in conjunction with our exhibitions and projects. Thank you to our Kemper Museum docents who offer so much of their time and expertise in interpreting the exhibitions and permanent collection with such great energy and enthusiasm. Underwriting for the docent program is generously provided by the family of Mary Beth Smith. A special thank you to those who supported the exhibition, Deani Whitehawk Speaking to Relatives, Kemper Family Foundations, National Endowment of the Arts, and the Missouri Arts Council. Kemper Museum is sponsoring this program in partnership with the Missouri Humanities Council and with support from the National Endowment for the Humanities and many others. And a warm thank you to our Kemper Museum members your support of the museum helps to make all of our exhibitions and programs free. If you are not yet a member, it is easy to sign up. You can go to our website at www.kemperart.org. Thank you, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Diani Whitehawk and Carmen Ermo. Hi, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, I forgot to say, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to either um, type them in the Q&A in the chat, and we will find some time towards the end of the program to be sure to answer as many questions as we can. So how are you both doing today? Go ahead, Craig. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for the great introduction, and thanks to everyone for tuning in. Jose, thanks for the support in the chat. Um, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so honored to be, you know, in conversation with Diani, you know, have been invited by Diani and Jade to contribute to this catalog. Um, and yeah, just so thrilled. So wish I could be there with y'all, but um, <laughs> hello virtually. Yes, hello, hello. Thank you, Carmen. I, I'm, I'm doing really good. I'm in the exhibition for the first time, as is the first time I'm beginning to see it. So I'm a little um, uh, Twitter-pated. I'm uh, stunned and happy. I'm just so happy to be in the museum and in the space and to see what an amazing job you guys did. So I'm really good this morning. Thank you. Well, I guess it's not morning anymore, this afternoon. <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. And I'm so glad that you both are doing well and that you both were available for this conversation. So thank you so much. I'm excited to get started. So the first question I have is in 2019 and 2020, Diana, you really pushed yourself and started working with media that was new for you, including photography and video work. What prompted this exploration? The... Well, I guess what prompted it was just 
envisioning works that were going to relay a, you know, a particular message or an extension of messages that I had already been working through in painting and in mixed media works, but that I felt like really necessitated a different medium to, to um, drive home and, and make sure that, that, uh, that the context within the work and the content was really um, front and center and not so much abstracted or buried in the work, but the, the audience couldn't miss it. Um, and in some cases, you know, some works, you, you need that, you know, you need the message to, to come through in a particular way. Um, and these works, they also, I guess, had their own unique ways of how they were birthed. Um, the I Am Your Relative piece, the, the photo installation, came out of a performance piece. So I was asked to do, um, to speak at a fundraiser at, in Minneapolis for, the fundraiser was for Global Rights for Women, which is an organization that does um, global right, you know, uh, women's rights work globally. And they do some really important work. And um, so I was asked to come in and to speak about you know, issues around, you know, rights for women within native communities. And so, um, but I had seven minutes at a, at a fundraising gala, right? So at a gala, everybody's all dressed fancy and they're eating dinner and they're visiting and, and having fun. And um, it's like, how do I talk about, you know, violence against Native women and the epidemic of MMIWR in seven minutes to an audience that might not be familiar with um, some of the issues that our communities face in regards to missing and uh, murdered Indigenous women and relatives folks. A lot of people don't know about it and that's part of what perpetuates it. And so this, this um, performance piece came to mind and I asked some of my friends and relatives to come and um, create this work with me where I, I handmade the first batch of t-shirts, like painted the <laughs> lettering, stenciled the lettering on the t-shirts and, um, and it reads this message um, without looking at it in, on a computer right now. Let me see if I can get to it, but it reads, I am um, more than your fantasy. Uh, the first t-shirt says I am. The second, you know, the, uh, on each woman, on each woman, uh, more than your fantasy, more than your desire, more than a mascot, ancestral love, parent sacrifice, your relative. And so each one of the women came onto the stage and the first one was my daughter and it, um, she came up and I had each of them hold the stage for just five seconds on their own. So the first one came up, I am. Um, wait, let me back up. Before we before we did that, in order to get everybody's attention, before we took the stage, we all lead lead really loud. Um, so that those of you who you know that um, that sound that lead lead sound that uh, Native women make. Um, so we did that really loud, and everybody like we scared people. <laughs> My daughter was cracking up afterwards. She's like, "I really scared somebody," um, but it but it made everybody, you know, it, it drawed everybody in. It, it got their attention and it, it hushed the whole crowd. And then my girl went up there first and it said, I am, and she held the stage for five seconds. And then we built on the sentence, five second pause in between so that folks could read this message and really take it in in silence first before I started talking about these, um, the statistics that our, our communities face uh, and the violence against our women relatives and, um, and relatives at large. And it, it was a really effective um, performance and it really hit home and it was really meaningful to people. And I had a lot of people come up afterwards and thank me and, and yet it felt like it needed to live on just beyond just this singular audience and that it needed to, I needed to figure out a way to continue to be able to share um, that information because part of what supports that violence against um, our relatives is invisibility, is the lack of um, knowledge and, and understanding of what our communities are facing. And so, uh, you know, artists have a unique um, uh, access to a platform in where we can speak to the public, right? And so I wanted to figure out a way to continue to create 
access to that conversation and to, to make Native women super visible and to humanize them and to then individual up, make sure that folks are seeing and understanding them as individual human beings and individual human beings that are um, vital to their communities and who they are, you know, individual tribes. And so the front, you know, the photos are, are life size. So, and they stand in a, in a row so that you are, um, they're like a, they're, they're a collective front, right? And uh, you can't avoid them. And they are there in all their individuality and all their beauty and all their humanity. And each one is adorned in um, ribbon skirts and jewelry that's specific to their tribe. And then the back of the photos, so they're double-sided photos, the back of the photos are each of their tribal affiliations. So that you can also understand that they're not just quote unquote Native American. Native American is not this, you know, one, uh, group of people, but you know, unique tribes, unique cultures, unique uh, people within those cultures and tribes. Um, so that work came out of, you know, trying to figure out a way to make that uh, performance piece live on. And I, that work, I'm not a photographer. Uh, so I, I leaned on my friend, Tom Jones, who's a photographer, he's Ho-Chunk and uh, faculty at University of Wisconsin-Madison and he did the photography and um, I'm really grateful for his collaboration. And then the listen piece, which is an eight channel video installation featuring um, eight different women speaking their native languages and it's filmed in their um, native homelands. And so the videos layer um, footage of the land uh, over behind and within uh, the woman that's speaking her language and so that you can have the opportunity to be introduced to a native language um, as tied to the individuality of a woman and as tied to the land to which those uh, the woman and the language are from. And that piece came from questioning. So one of the biggest issues with the native artists face, but really native people at large um, is again, this tremendous gap of knowledge, you know, most folks, a lot of, you know, uh, the general public, general American public, we're, they're not taught about the true history of this country. We're not taught about Native people and communities. Uh, Native people and communities are rarely included in mainstream uh, media and um, education and all of these things. So there's this just tremendous gap. And so anytime, you know, I have, or any other Native artists, we have meetings with curators and oftentimes we have to give them a whole history lesson before they can even understand like what we're talking about in a particular piece. And it's really hard. And that is the truth for really any work. It's not just issues of an artist, but that gap of understanding, like you have to tackle so much like education and, and um, uh, just bringing people up to speed so that they, they can get what you're trying to do. And sat in my studio and was like, how do you even begin to start to tackle that? It feels impossible. We don't have control of the public education system and that's a huge part of it. And because of that, like, how do you, how do you start to chip away at that? And that question is really what the Listen series came from. And I thought, well, I don't have the ability to teach the whole nation Native history and, and you know, bring everybody up to speed on, on the true history of this country, but maybe I can provide an experience where folks can at least be introduced to the fact that that gap is there, that that chasm of, of unknowing exists. And so that's where Listen comes from. And it's um, the didactic on the wall asks folks, uh, you know, how many languages can you identify by sound? If you were, you know, in a cafe or walking down the sidewalk, if you make a list of how many languages you could identify just by sound, even if you don't know one word, you can't interpret it, you know what language it is. Like, oh, that's German, that's French, that's Spanish, that's Japanese, that's Chinese. I mean, if you went through, it's a long list. Most of us can identify by sound, you know, probably upwards of 15 to 20 languages at least. But those languages are from other continents. They're from other places, they're not from here. And then simultaneously, how many languages from this land base could you identify by sound? A lot of Americans wouldn't be able to identify any native languages from this, you know, languages that are from here. That's profound. 
So this piece simply provides an opportunity for folks to have an epiphany of how much they've not been taught, how much they've not been exposed to, how much, you know, the tremendous effects of colonization. Uh, so it introduces, you know, gives you an opportunity to tour the space and at least be introduced to eight native languages as tied to a specific woman and the geography from which that language is, is rooted. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's one of the things that I just love about the listen piece in particular is when I walk through the space and I see people in the galleries and, you know, they spend the time with each of the works. And it's really clear, you know, that everyone that comes to visit is really interested in hearing and at least, you know, not understanding, but at least hearing and being able to then hopefully recognize the languages. So that's very exciting exciting. Carmen, your essay was fantastic and we're so grateful that you were able to write um, in the catalog and I remember you were really, um, um, your analysis on both Listen and I Am Your Relative was so strong. Can I ask you what drew you to those two works? Thank you. Oh, Diani, so good to just hear you kind of speak about the work. It's so fantastic. Yeah, I, um, I really appreciated the invitation to kind of write from this context of a feminist art curator, which, you know, I'm lucky to have the, the F word in my real title, which is like a privilege and a positioning I really enjoy. Um, and clearly, you can tell if you're listening to Yanni, like many of the foundational elements of her practice, like can be categorized as feminism. And I think it's um, really important to acknowledge that in the United States, a lot of the kind of ideas that came up around first and second wave feminism were definitely drawn from, sometimes most times uncredited, from indigenous women. Um, they're just, you know, matrilineal societies and networks of care. Um, so just wanting to put that out there. But those two works for me were really interesting because I have to say, partially my interest, partially the way feminist art is seen and uh, made legible in the world is heavily through photography, performance, images, right, of, of strife, of oppression, things that are recognizable in terms of kind of, you know, a certain either narrative or didacticism that's like pushing you to either have a realization or maybe make an action in your life or around you, et cetera. And I actually found it more challenging personally to write about Diani's like abstract work through the lens of feminism, right? And thinking about how abstraction is also you know, something that comes from a matrilineal history. And I know Diani will talk a little bit about that, but um, those two works in particular for me were just so powerful. Listen and I'm your relative because they really, you know, they kind of, for me, kind of have that association with like a, a very legible, like, okay, this is feminist art. We're seeing women taking a stand. We're seeing this, you know, individualization of indigenous women, you know, kind of pushing against the silence, pushing against the invisibility through these gestures that come from, you know, images, right, and imagery that we're seeing in, in video and photography. And I really love, too, in one of the specific videos in Listen, um, I think it's a Quechua woman, but I might be mistaken, where you can actually almost hear her saying American, like clearly some, you know, there is a reference there to Americans, and there's just that moment where you're sort of breaking through and saying, okay, I, I just heard that, right? I, I think I heard that. And and then recognizing that, yeah, like those those kind of systems of legibility and visibility, you know, can also be about protection and about, you know, entire world that myself, you know, as a white cis woman, like I don't, I'm, I'm not getting what they're saying. There's no tiny little translation for me. I'm, I'm used to having the world cater to my perspective. And instead kind of recognizing that, that it's so important to make that space as Yanni does in her work overall for indigenous women, for their art, for their lives, you know, for their individuality. And um, yeah, I think in that essay, I really tried to grapple with um, connecting that back to the abstractions. And, you know, Tiani's sitting in front of one of her massive um, paintings right now that, you know, of course, is reading symbolically. And, and I'm sure all of us are, you know, impressed by the scale and the kind of triangle forms. But you were able to get up close to that to really see the intense, painstaking, um, uh, stroke by stroke detailing of these works, where that overall impression of the painting is actually made and created through these almost infinitesimal 
lines, I really read into that this kind of feminist metaphor for collectivity and for all the voices that come together and all the efforts that come together. And specifically in Diani's work and having had the pleasure of doing like a virtual studio visit and reading a lot around her work and all the catalogs, uh, catalog essays that, you know, have contextualized her work before thinking about abstraction kind of as, um, as a, yeah, as a, as a language, as a visual language for feminism, I think was really interesting for me to grapple with. And um, it's really interesting because her work, of course, you know, talks about um, the legacies of women artists that are often unseen, right? I work in an institution that has a 200 year history and encyclopedic museum, the Brooklyn Museum. And the Brooklyn Museum, among many, you know, the way that they kind of categorize historically and up to today, the creativity and art of indigenous artists is, you know, removing the names, right? Names were often not noted during these kind of colonial acquisition projects. Um, and a lot of times too, there was of course this context of, you know, we're collecting this historical past that's no longer present, right? You know, that colonial museum project is also to sort of say, you know, we're, we're selecting white civilization as the pinnacle and all of these other civilizations, literally other in some cases, are, are in the past. And I think what's really powerful about Diani's work and the way she talks about it is this kind of like, yeah, revealing that veil and saying that actually, you know, most abstract artists in history were women um, coming from indigenous traditions um, and indigenous present, you know, they are resolutely present. And I know some of Diani's work also touches on kind of hierarchies around the idea of craft, um, which I think we'll probably get to later. But like, again, within the feminist context, realizing that Native women artists have this kind of like triple oppressions around them where it's like the anonymity, um, the kind of historicizing, right, and seeing them only in the past. And again, this kind of classic art historical painting and sculpture is better than craft. And we can't be looking at, um, you know, the incredible abstractions on a par flesh bag or, you know, in beadwork on the same level as these great white men that we've become accustomed to reading in the narrative. Um, but I think what I love about Siani's work is it says, hey, those great white men, we're looking at the Navajo traditions, we're looking at the weavers, we're looking at the attraction that women, uh, you know, indigenous women were making and continue to make today. So I think that's a really kind of interesting um, revelation that happens um, sort of within, uh, within the larger project, right? It's, like it's there in the paintings, but it's also in the way that you talk about your work and Jade, the way that you, you know, contextualize the show as well. Great, thank you. And that's such a good point. One of the goals that I had was that at every door, you could see the women and I am your relative. And I just thought that that was really important to, um, to be able to see these real life women living today as you're walking through the exhibition and really um, experiencing all the different media that Diana uses. So thank you, that's wonderful. So I also wanted to know, Diani, I really enjoyed hearing you speak about the importance of the beads in Carry 3, which um, for people who've had an opportunity to see the exhibition, it's the uh, freestanding red um, tall uh, sculpture. Um, and I was wondering if you could share with everyone the significance of the red beads in that work. Sure thing. Um, so I use a variety of, uh, vintage or um, and antique beads combined with some contemporary beads. And so the antique beads and the, the antique and vintage beads, um, the old beads, we'll just use that word. <laughs> they're, they're unique, you know, uh, older beads have specific colors and um, they were made you know, at a time where their, you know, the technology was not as developed and so their consistency isn't the same as a lot of contemporary beads that are, are super precise, right? Or, and they have, you know, particular dye lots and you can, you know, there's still some varieties at times, but there's a lot more consistency in contemporary beads. And so using old glass beads is really, um, I think can, oh, and a lot of beaters, a lot of native beaters really covet and collect and find and seek out these old glass beads. One, because they hearken back to the works that our ancestors have made. So there's certain colors that like certain tribes, you know, really utilized and are really fond of. And, 
And so those, you know, those old bead colors are really coveted with bead artists today because we're like, man, you know, we, we see like the moccasins and the leggings and the dresses and all, you know, all the that older work that was made that we, we study and we love so much. Um, but you can't find like the same colors in a contemporary bead. But also I think that the, the variety and the shape can make for a really beautiful piece because there's so much um, organic movement and, and variety that comes out of using that. And so the beads, but it also means, you know, they're not as easy to find and to source. And for some, like once you've used it, it's that it's gone unless you, you know, miraculously stumble upon somebody's stash sometime later down the road, but you're, that's not a guarantee. And so the, the red beads that are the fill and carry three are, are one of those beads. It's a, um, you know, I bought a certain quantity. They're called white hearts. So it's a red translucent bead on the outside, but the center of the bead is white. Um, and white hearts are something that were really, um, any native beater can talk to you about their love for white hearts because it's a, it's a beautiful bead and it's something that, you know, our ancestors used a lot and um, for very obvious reasons but that particular size and that particular color I don't have enough left to make another piece with that and so if I find it later down the road I might be able to make something with them again but I can't replicate that exact size color and um, bead you know in the next piece because I would have to find the next batch of white hearts that are that same color, that are that same size. So there's special beads. So there's a number of, of works that, you know, unless, unless folks know about beads or unless folks ask, um, they don't understand that actually the beads that are on there are, are you know, they make it that much more exciting because they're special. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And Carmen, you talked a little bit about craft um, and the answer to the last question, but I didn't know if there was anything additional you wanted to add, specifically thinking about um, the works in the carry series. Yeah, and I think I might have frozen there for a second, but I, right, I was like, I felt like I, okay, I'm back good. <laughs> I went to a different portal. But um, yeah, I mean, I love these works. I feel like they are so, there's something too about, maybe you already talked about the Sionic, so sorry, that was in the frozen land, but, um, that kind of lavishness of how they're almost, you know, taking a, a form that may be recognizable or is, you know, a historical reference, but amplifying it in such a way that it really feels like it's kind of like exceeding those boundaries, exceeding those expectations that people bring to craft, right? And I think what's, what's amazing about kind of like a post, you know, 1970s feminist world where, you know, that's really a moment where you had lots of artists shaking up these material hierarchies and literally protesting for better representation of, you know, artists of color, uh, you know, these kind of shakeups that happen at institutions help us kind of unbound some of these narratives and also hear from people like, what do they find interesting? And I think the like quote unquote craft form and function is something that, you know, we live with items, right? Like all of us love our, you know, favorite earrings and, you know, our beloved salad bowl or what have you, or something that's passed, you know, passed down through, through families and generations. And I think there's just something really beautiful about like taking an object that it feels like it can, it can nourish you, like the Carrie series does, um, but also recognizing that it's sort of like pushing and pulling at some of those expectations that visitors, um, you know, in the art world too, really has about what, what these objects mean. Yeah, that's a great point. And one of the things that I really um, love about the Carry series is just how tall they are, like how much of a presence they have and how you really have to think about your body in its space. And I love that, you know, like that flip in the hierarchical narrative and like, they are what's important. They're what I have to think about moving around. So it's wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Can I, oh, I was going to say, can I respond to that quickly, Jane? Yes, of course. Just, um, I'm really glad that you guys are, you know, are feeling that, seeing that, thinking about that for, for folks that haven't, you know, gotten to read anything about that body of work or, or hear me speak about it. They're, um, they're utilitarian objects. In other words, you could actually use them, you know, um, they're, they're vessels. So 
uh, their bags. See, the first one is, is actually like a purse. Um, and the second and the third are these copper buckets and ladles. And our work uh, historically, you know, one of, one of the ways, one of the approaches that Native work has been othered within the uh, canon of, of art history and um, art institutions and, and literature is that it's, you know, these uh, labels of, well, it's utilitarian, it's decorative, it's craft, and they're all really surface and misguided evaluations and critiques and divisions and categories that have been applied to our work and they're just not representative of the truth. And so I wanted to create these works that are functional objects, right? Um, but to emphasize the fact that our work, even though native work has been functional and is functional, um, the traditions of it and you know, it's the way that it's been passed down over time, there is, um, there are teachings and worldviews and cosmologies and histories embedded into those works. So they're functional, but they are also conceptual and abstract and symbolic, and they are embedded with a generation's worth of conversation. Those generations, like the generation's worth of conversation, that's the thing that like art history prides itself on, right? Like art, you know, art history as in Western art history, as in art with a capital A, the way we've all been taught it so far in academia is like, well, it's important because it's got these generations worth of continuity and, you know, one generation responding to the next generation, all of that and, um, assumption that, that works outside of that, you know, singular perspective, don't do that just as a flawed and false assumption. Um, and our works do the same thing. So to, to create these, but you know, the, this body of work, I'm not gonna like dance with that bag. I'm not gonna pour water with that bucket. It has a different function in a gallery in a museum space. It's supposed to, you know, it, it's, so I'm, I'm using cultural, you know, re I'm using references to cultural works or cultural, um, uh, you know, the uh, practices, I guess I'll say. Um, and so I'm, I'm pulling references from those, but I'm not bringing those things directly into this space. You know, I'm, I, it's, it's, it, they've been morphed to serve the purpose that they serve here. And so they're different, you know, the fringe is crazy long. You wouldn't be able to dance with that fringe. It would be <laughs> dirty and dragging and getting in the way, but they're meant to take up space, right? They're meant to push back against those categories that say, oh, that thing goes in that gallery over there. Like here you're faced, you, you are, uh, you have to acknowledge that they're in the space. You have to see them and you have to give them their due respect and walk around them and, um, there, yeah, that so that the long fringe is really about making sure that they they take up their their respected due space. Wonderful, and I think that's a perfect segue into the next question I had, which is Diani. One of the things that I really appreciate about your work and in talking with you is, you know, that you're very quick to say, you know, you're not the only contemporary Native artists working. And so I want to ask you both: Is there are there any Native artists um, that you're excited about right now? I really want to hear Carmen go first. <laughs> okay, okay, it's such a great, oh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, it's such a fantastic question. And I feel like, you know, one of the, one of the things that I thought was really interesting when I was researching Diani's like, just life and work was also her role as a curator and, you know, as an organizer of exhibitions, but we can get to that later. But I think I, I really, um, really love the work of Natalie Ball. Um, I am, just a personal love of found objects and kind of taking objects that already sort of like carry either the touch of the body or kind of like a domestic quality to them and then exploding that outward into these fantastic kind of like combined sculptural installation forms, a little bit of humor, a little bit of creepiness, lots of kind of critique on, you know, the ways uh, that Indigenous women have been contextualized, seen, visualized, stereotyped, etc. There's this one piece I love um, of, called Pussy Hats from 2018. So kind of right after this post-Trump moment where, you know, 
we were seeing like a lot of smiling white women um, be the ones kind of given the credit for this outward facing Trump activism, even though now we look back and after everything that's happened, you know, in the past few years, recognizing really that it's women of color who have been leading this movement. Um, but these pussy hats aren't pink and shiny and happy and joyful. They really kind of carry kind of like a weight and they're sort of looking back at you. Really intense, amazing work. Um, I also recently saw a show by Raven Half Moon in Chelsea here in New York that got me thinking again about Biani, an artist who works in large scale sculpt uh, ceramics, excuse me, and Raven's signature is humongous on these ceramics, right? And thinking again about the erasure of indigenous native artists, of uh, women artists in particular and their role in art history. And just seeing these signatures, you know, literally like larger, you know, than my Zoom screen. Um, and and knowing that that, you know, I talked, you know, to the to the person in the gallery and having a little conversation about the work saying, yes, that's exactly what Craven is going for, this idea that like you will not erase this you know, Native women artists' names, that no matter, you know, what happens from here on out in history, this artwork literally has this humongous signature on it. And then definitely, like, in the last few weeks, um, Re Rebecca Belfort is just an incredible artist. Um, she had a really important retrospective a few years ago now um, that didn't make it to New York, right? A lot of kind of, like, attention to New York as an art center, but sometimes New York really fails to recognize you know, artists that are really transforming culture, if you ask me. And so Rebecca Belmore's website is just like an amazing resource that has information on pretty much all of her performances, um, sometimes even kind of like videos and details. So it's definitely just an incredible resource, amazing. So those are three artists that like kind of come to mind for me. There's so many more, but um, yeah, now, now, now we have to compare and contrast, Liani. <laughs> no, that's a, it, those are great, great examples and I appreciate you bringing them up. And I, um, <laughs> As a person who's, who's you know, as an artist who's also worked as a curator, and it is like a deep passion of mine to make sure that folks are thinking about the field of Native arts. Um, and I, I am not fond of the fact that there's, um, there are two different sentences. Let me start over. There are a tremendous amount of Native artists doing fabulous work, and we have a really rich and thriving field. Um, I'm not fond of the fact that there's a tiny handful of those artists that people within um, kind of mainstream institutions and academia are familiar with. Those artists, those few, like, like the, the roster of like five players on the basketball team that get out and that folks can identify and, and know are, are fabulous artists. And I'm grateful that they're there and they're doing good and important work. Um, and all hats off and due respect to those artists. I'm not gonna list them because they're folks that people are familiar with. So hats off to y'all, you know who you are. Um, <laughs> but some of the folks that I wanna uh, that I wanna point to, I have a long list. So I'm gonna name drop and y'all can do your research later. Um, but first I want to, <laughs> first I wanna, um, you know, Tom Jones and Rizal Benali. I mentioned Tom Jones. He's the photographer that helped me do the I Am Your Relative piece. I didn't get to mention Rizal's name yet. Rizal is an up and coming filmmaker. Um, she's Oglala Lakota in Diné and went to the Institute of American Indian Arts and she's about to graduate from Tisch and she's doing good, big, beautiful things. Um, and if you get a chance to see the listen work, you'll get to see uh, the grace and the beauty that she can create with the camera. Um, and then some of these people, you know, they've gotten some, some good due credit, but they're folks that I think need to be at the top of people's minds as well. So Rose B. Simpson uh, is a dear friend of mine and she is phenomenal. And she has things to offer the world. And I hope you all take a moment to look her up and listen. Uh, Marie Watt is amazing and she's a heavy hitter, but she also doesn't quite get as much as she like, man, she, she deserves a lot. She deserves the world. Her work is fantabulous and she's been one of my favorite artists for a very long time. Um, same thing with Brian Youngin. He's, you know, a heavy hitter too, but um, I, you know, I don't know that he's gotten as much attention in the States as he does in Canada and he is phenomenal and also has been one of my art heroes for, for years. So I'm gonna give a little shout out to my Minnesota-based crew. Um, Andrea Carlson is a fantastic painter. Jim Denemy is an amazing painter. Julie Buffalohead is an amazing painter and printmaker. Uh, Maggie Thompson, uh, text 
textile artist, and well, she does a lot of different things. Jada Gray Eagle is an up and coming uh, photographer. She does beadwork as well. Um, Jean Quick to See Smith is a heavy hitter, but she's somebody, she's one of the, you know, one of the only artists that um, you go into mainstream museums, and she is one of the only Native artists that I know I can find in big museums. One, y'all. <laughs> It's her. So I got to give her her, her props. Um, Jamie Okuma, Carrie Atambi, uh, Terry Greaves, and uh, uh, Tanya Larson are all folks doing amazing things in beadwork and metal smithing and uh, uh, design and fashion. Uh, Emmy Whitehorse has been a longtime favorite painter of mine. The entire Growing Thunder uh, family, it's like, uh, uh, Grandma, mom, and daughter who do some of the most amazing beadwork and quill work you can find. Look them up. You'll be happy you did. Uh, Marty and Mike Tubles are um, two friends and uh, fantastic. They're multimedia artists, printmakers, painters, design, sculpture. Uh, their relative Molina Parker, Keith Braveheart. Um, is a fantastic painter and uh, community. Uh, really community engagement specialist. Uh, Henry Payer is a Ho-Chunk painter whose work uh, needs to be seen by the world because he's wildly gifted. Kara Romero is a fantastic photographer, doing big things. Uh, Sonia Kelleher Combs is a painter and mixed media artist who's been a longtime favorite, as has C. Max Stevens. Jenny Kapperman is my studio assistant extraordinaire, and she does fabulous sewing and beadwork and uh, Jackie Larson Bread is a fantastic uh, beadwork artist, as is Hollis Cheeto and Elias Not Afraid. D.Y. Begay is an amazing weaver. Um, Damien Dene Yaji is doing amazing um, installation, neon, uh, video, just ripping up um, uh, the status quo and pushing people to think larger. Norman Akers, John Hitchcock, Marwin Begay, amazing printmakers. I could go on and on and on and on and on. But the point is the reason why I give you a big long list like that, and that's a tiny list. But the reason why I'm saying that many names is that so many people, like I, I give talks and I ask like, you know, university size rooms, how many of y'all can list three native artists? I get usually a very tiny amount of hands and sometimes none. I've been in some universities where nobody raises their hand and otherwise there'll be like three or four people and sometimes it's usually like the faculty that have invited me. <laughs> and so the reality is, is, you know, there are so many native artists for any of, you know, friends or, or um, peers that watch this later, if your name wasn't on the list, you know, I love you and you know, I, I value you and think highly of you, but I just wanted to you know, provide an example of kind of the breadth of, of Native artists that are out there. There are you know, people doing things in, in every medium and mediums you maybe haven't even heard of yet. Um, oh yeah, Mona Cliff, yes, thank you y'all. <laughs> there's so many, there's so many. And I just am appreciative of them all. And I hope that more people get an opportunity to dig into the phenomenal uh, wealth of artists that is uh, within the Native arts world. Oh my God, that list was so amazing. I, it really, you know, the intro you kind of gave too reminded me of this one time when we, uh, like I co-curated with Catherine Morris, this collection exhibition, half the picture that was kind of meant to look at hot feminist topics, but over a hundred years, right? To kind of show like these topics cycle back, um, you know, these issues are, are persistent. And that show included John Quick to see Smith, Wendy Redstar, Shan Goshorn, and um, Lisa Rehana, who's a Maori. But I remember meeting somebody kind of out in the art world, and they, and that was out of like 40 something artists. And I met this person out in the art world, and I said, Oh, yeah, I'm at the Broken Museum. And that person was like, I need to get to the Broken Museum because I, just, I know there's a show that has, has Native American artists in it. And I literally stopped and like was racking my brain. I was like, Oh my God, what show is that? And then I was like, Oh my God, it's my show. Um, but like recognizing, and realizing like in that moment, like, wow, a show that literally had like four artists, like out of this large, you know, collection um, installation was like on somebody's radar um, because there is just kind of such a dearth of that, uh, you know, exploration that obviously the Kemper is taking so seriously and obviously giving Diani her well-deserved uh, survey exhibition. So just putting that out there too. <laughs> 
Oh, I appreciate that, Carmen. And that's a great observation. The, it's kind of amazing the fact that you didn't think about it before. Like you just had those artists in there as artists because that's just it. It's like folks don't, folks have not been looking at and exposed to native artists long enough to just see us as artists. And so often we are specialized and categorized and still created, you know, like your native art goes in your native art section. It goes in that gallery. It's, you know, your native curator curates native art. It's like, you know, we are participants in the art world at large and could be and should be included in all those exhibitions, um, curating all of the work, doing all of the things just like everybody else gets to. But so often because folks don't know us yet, it's this specialized thing, right? And, um, and there are times and places where we need to be able to, I think, highlight and specialize folks from within a particular community and celebrate that community, right? But we also have to recognize the fact that we're participants within the world, you know, and, and that our voices are valuable in all those contexts. And so I, I love that you hadn't thought about it yet. And then you're like, oh, wait a minute, there are four Native artists at my show. And that is worth something. We should go check it out. And that's that's fantastic. And um, you know, Wendy and uh, Jeff Gibson and um, uh, Chinupa Hanska Luger is doing good things. I mean, people are, you know, there's, there's, there's a, a handful of artists that people have gotten to know, you know, and Jean being one of them, but um, it's, it's hard, hard to see that it's still just simple when I know there are so many, you know, and, um, and so I hope that, you know, this exhibition and talks like this lead up to you know people taking it upon themselves to do a little bit more research to look dig a little deeper to look a little farther and and to make an effort to make sure that when they're building a roster of exhibits for an you know a, re a roster of artists for an exhibition that they're remembering um oh you know there might be some native artists i haven't talked about yet or haven't thought about or even discovered yet like um, you know i'm gonna dig in and start doing the research because once you start um, looking at you know some of the museums that have historically really supported Native artists and you start following those threads it's actually fairly easy to access <laughs> uh, the, the Native arts field at large you know and there's a lot of resources out there so once you start digging it's it's not hard to find. Well thank you both so much for those lists and you're so right and hopefully everyone who was um, who's here was taking notes. And then if not, we do have the recording so that you can continue to expand your knowledge. So thank you both for that. And I um, am just looking at the time and I wanna be sure to open it up to questions from the audience. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A or the chat. I'll be um, checking both. And while you're typing, I'll ask one um, additional question. So Carmen, I so loved that you were able to contribute to the catalog and we talked about this and how your essay was so eye-opening when thinking about Diani's work um, through a feminist lens. And I'm wondering if you didn't have a word count, was there anything additional you would have liked to include? <laughs> yes, this question, you know, this question is near and dear to my heart because as Diani and Jade both know, I already like stretch the limit of the word count and then the footnotes were kind of long I felt like I just had a lot to engage with like it was there's just so much in your you know in your practice Diani like from so many different angles I really like I feel like it literally turned into just a footnote that comment about you being a curator right maybe another essay another time we'll talk about that like definitely interested in like this legacy of feminist artists like Anna Mendieta, Linda Goodbryan, you like who who also like care for and contextualize their community, right? Like you just said, like kind of in the absence of sort of these major institutions doing it, um, making sure that those networks are still happening, that those exhibitions are still occurring, that people are finding each other. Like that is something that definitely, uh, you know, was sort of like, okay, well, can't get to that. Let's put that another day. And I even remember there were just like whole bodies of work that I had in my little outline, but at the time I kind of got through, um, you know, the, this, you know, uh, the abstraction that I already kind of touched on and some other things like it was just you know it, it was already gone you know the word count it's just such a such a like uh super generative practice and just like calls up so much to mind us I was so happy to you know share the page with Jane's essay and Kathleen Ash Milby who you know also talked about abstraction um 
you know, historically, but even bringing in language as a kind of abstraction, which I hadn't thought about, but totally connected into kind of like the feminist themes of the Listen project. You know, there were so many, so many amazing moments. And, you know, even just thinking about like last week's, um, you know, acknowledgement of missing and murdered indigenous women, um, girls and two spirit folks like that moment that a lot of us saw where Instagram was literally taking down people's posts and um, you know censoring and shadow banning its calls and you know your posts aren't getting seen uh, folks who were talking about it right and a lot of people in my circle like our posts were all taken down so kind of even more important right to acknowledge the permanence of a project like Diani's like the importance again of like a museum like Kemper putting this on view making sure there's a catalog right so, catalog is beautiful you know um and it's it's there right and it's gonna it's gonna live on past you know instagram's you know uh moment of the you know like hot issue of the day kind of ebbing and flowing like this this really is kind of like that uh important work of, of you know why we turn to artists right as guides like this message that will carry forward um Wonderful, thank you. And I don't see any questions in the chat or the Q&A. So before we end, do either of you have any last thoughts or, oh, I had a question that can kind of be, I'm sure you can wrap it up into your last thoughts. Um, oh, wait, 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 here's something from Q&A. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, someone said, thank you both so much. I'd love to hear from either or both of you about the powerful screen print suite takes care of them. What does this work mean to you? And do you think of it as an intermedial work? I don't know what's meant by intermedial work. Uh, one of you guys want to give it a test? <laughs> Intermedial. I don't, I'm sorry. I'm going to have to, sit, you know, fess up and get and just admit I don't know what, what you mean by that. Carmen, do you have a, a guess? I, I wonder if that actually means like mixed media because I I oh. had a chance to see that work recently in New York with a friend who's a literal printmaker, and we were walking by. And he's like, "Oh, this is so amazing." I was like, "These, these are prints." He's like, "Wait a second. Wait, no. I I refuse because yeah, I'll let Diani talk about her work. But that moment where you recognize that." Uh, yeah, the medium is kind of mixed and um, again, upending expectations. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just s opened the little window to Ramey, if, the, if that's not what you meant, let us know. But um, that makes sense to me. It, it, it is um, mixed media. Okay, cool. Uh, I can speak to that. I'm like, intermedial, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, but, uh, it, is, it, is, so it is somewhat mixed media in the fact that it's, screen printing, you know, the vast majority of it is screen printing, but there are moments of foil. Um, so all of the, the spots, like at the bottom of the green dress, all, that are all the spots that are on those dresses that are meant to represent um, sequins, brass and silver sequins that have been used on our, our work for as long as we've been kind of trading for those items, those are all done in a foil. So there's, you know, adhesive put down and then foil put on top of that. And so it's a little bit mixed media in the fact that, you know, it's screen printing and foil. Um, but they're, they are, you know, predominantly screen printing, um, but they're, you know, they were really meant to emulate and to uh, speak to the mediums that are used in dressmaking. So, you know, the, the, we thought very carefully about how particular ink choices work. Um, you know, some are presented without a gloss uh, coat over top, some are presented with a gloss coat, some are different layers of that gloss, gloss coating. Uh, the layering of the specific inks, like all of those choices are meant to mimic wool, uh, dentilium shell, um, uh, what's the name? I'm blanking on the name of the pink shell, conch shell. Um, you know, they're, they're meant to operate to um, speak to all these different elements that are put together in dresses. So they're not mixed media per se, but they're meant to emulate these works that are mixed media. 
And um, what does it mean to me? Uh, that's a long conversation. We're going to have run out of time. But the quick summary is that those works are meant to represent and kind of pay tribute to um, Native women in the way that they collectively care for our communities. So it's, it's a body of work that recognizes kinship relationships that extend beyond just your, your immediate family. I mean, they, they honor, you know, those immediate family relationships, you know, mother and, and daughter and but they um, pay tribute to grandmother and auntie and cousin and all of these things. And so our, our communities are really, um, you know, focused very strongly on that extended family and made family. So most tribes have practices of making family too. And so these, that body of work is, is about kind of recognizing that and the, the various ways that through their multiple personalities, their multiple roles within a community, the multiple ways that uh, women collectively care for and nurture our communities. That's kind of the short and sweet version of what that body of work uh, represents. Wonderful. And then there's another question. Oh, they did ask for you both. Carmen, did you have anything? I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no. Yeah, I think that was a great, a great response. Like, I really thought, thought that work was so thrilling. And I, and I, and I recall, too, like, in our studio visit, you mentioning that some of the kind of original ideas that I also came from these, you know, honorific parades, honoring veterans, and especially like Native American veterans, obviously, have such a size role um, in the U.S. military, and, you know, recognizing, too, like, how some of those narratives are almost never really seen in the, the art world, right? It's kind of like the remove itself from that. And I think, in some ways, it's important to recognize, like, yeah, those sacrifices, those uh, realities um, that have, you know, passed the generations and that strength, especially for women, um, so powerful. I love, I just love those words. <laughs> I mean, Thank you. And then the final question is, in admiring and collecting work by Native artists, is there a fear of cultural appropriation? Does it change with wearable art versus two or three dimensional pieces for homes or galleries? I heard something. <laughs> and there we go. Okay. Oh, yeah. You guys can hear me. Okay. So um, it, it's a good question. I'm glad you're asking it. Cultural appropriation comes at, into play when folks outside of our communities decide that they're going to take inspiration from our communities and create things themselves that are just kind of continued taking, continued theft of, you know, we, our communities have faced so much theft of land, family structures, culture, language, family members. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, right? And so when somebody else decides, oh, I really like Native art, you know, and it's a non-Native person and they, they look at those things and they're like, I'm, I'm gonna create, or, you know, I'm gonna create work that, because I'm drawing inspiration from this beautiful culture or fashion designers, oh, the fashion industry is terrible with this, right? And they're like, oh, it's so beautiful. We're gonna take inspiration. We're gonna create new works. And it's just, it feels like one more piece of theft, like back off and let us keep something. Um, so that, that's where cultural appropriation is, but cultural appreciation, buying work from native artists, please do. Um, you know, please do buy those things and please put them in your home. We're making them for those purposes. We're making them to share. And as, as the artists, we're deciding where and when those limits may be, right? Like there's certain things I'm never going to bring into a gallery and museum space. There's certain elements of, of my culture that I, like for me, I, you know, I've figured out where my, um, where my boundaries lie, you know? And so that's, that's our job to figure out. And, and once we've presented it, you know, yes, you can purchase this piece, then yes, please do purchase this piece from a native artist, not from some, you know, um, non-native person that thinks our work is pretty or they think native people are pretty and so they paint native people like that. And then as far as wearing stuff, please do, but buy from native people. They've made those decisions where and when 
uh, what's appropriate to sell to the public at large. But again, buy from native artists, buy from native makers. Don't buy the cheap stuff you see in Urban Outfitters or Target or wherever you see because you think native culture is pretty. Save your dollars and buy the real thing, buy the good stuff. There are so many native makers that make beautiful uh, jewelry and wearables and, and designs. And, you know, they're making those things for the public. Um, but when you're buying from native artists, you're supporting native communities, you're supporting it, that artist's practice. And um, they're not going to put something out there that they don't feel um, is, is for you to wear, or they won't offer it to you if they don't think it's for you. Um, and if they do, then that, you know that's something for them to figure out on their own. But um, <laughs> you know that's that's our job to figure out what's for the public and what's for strictly cultural use or uh, communal or family use. So I have you know a side of my practice that's just specifically for that. You know, the specifically for cultural use, specifically for family members, specifically for me or a family member to dance in. It's not made for the museum and gallery. And then there's a whole another side of my practice that's for public for the public, you know, and so when we offer something to the public, please, you know, we're inviting you to, to partake in that. And um, it's how, you know, a lot of us make our living. So uh, yeah, you, you know, feel free to wear something and celebrate it. And you can talk about that artist when you wear it. Wonderful, thank you. Well, before we end, does any, do either of you have any last thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap up? I just want to say thank you. I am so, so deeply grateful to you, Jade, for taking this exhibition on, for you know, believing in my work, for giving me my first uh, retrospective exhibition, for I have never seen my work take up this much space. Never. It's you know, I walked in the gallery today and was all choked up and was like, okay, I'm not gonna cry in here, but it's, it's such, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. And every single one of the Kemper folks that invested time and love and effort to bring this exhibition into the beauty that it is. I know it takes all the work and all the behind the scenes and um, your museum prep folks did an amazing job. Um, and everything, you know, it looks and presents as flawless because of all that love and effort that was put into it. So I'm, I'm just really indebted and grateful to all of that, to all of you, uh, to everybody involved at the Kemper. I'm so grateful for you, Carmen, and for Kathleen Ash Milby. You guys wrote such beautiful essays. And I, I read the catalog and I just was so, um, just filled with gratitude. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm so grateful that you extended your expertise, you know, to take the time to invest and, and think thoroughly and, and present a really beautiful, thoughtful essay. And Kathleen Ashmilby did the same thing and I'm really grateful to her and um, the practices that you guys uphold. You know, you both have really important practices, you know, beyond the essay for this catalog, you guys do great work and I'm just, Honored that you um, took the, you know, chose to take the time to um, reflect on my work within those practices. I, I'm really uh, honored and grateful for that. So, and to everybody who came here, and to everybody who bought a catalog, and to the folks that tuned in today, I'm just, you know, eternally grateful to you all. Oh, and to everybody that loaned the works, to all the people who own the works that decided that they'd be willing to loan it and and to let it live here. I'm grateful to every one of you that, that um, you know, you've invested your hard earned dollars into supporting my practice. And then you decided to send your babies off into the world and trust that they'd be okay. Um, <laughs> thank you to all of you as well. And then Carmen, did you have any last thoughts? I definitely got choked up. So it was like keeping that mute on for a second, a second more. Um, yeah, Diani, I mean, it was such an honor to know that you were, you know, interested in my take on your work. And Jane, like, congratulations to you both on this epic and important show. Again, I so wish I could be there and 
stalking all the, the Instagram and installation images and been lucky enough to see Gianni's work in person many times. Uh, but um, this is such an incredible historic moment, achievement, um, just celebration, right, of your, of your brilliance, of your work. And I'm so just so happy and honored to be a part of it. And thanks to everybody for tuning in and listening. You know, Gianni's work has so much more than, you know, a Zoom hour can give. And so I hope everybody will spend more time with it. Um, and yeah, just congrats all around and thank you. Well, thank you both so much. This has been a really wonderful conversation. I have enjoyed being able to speak with you. Um, thank you, Diani. Thank you, Carmen. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And just so you know, if you're in Kansas City, Diani Whitehawk speaking to relatives is open through Sunday. So please make some time so that you can see the exhibition one last time. <laughs> thank you all so much and have a wonderful day, evening, night, wherever you are. <laughs> Bye.